Yeah, so just to introduce myself very briefly, um, that's a, I thought I'd made a. Yeah, just to introduce myself very briefly, I'm I'm Steve Blay. Um, I'm currently a senior lecturer at London South Bank University, and before that, I spent 15 years working for the Home Office's fingerprint research team. Um, I added the first the first word there, interactive PowerPoints, because I saw that. Uh, Rachel had put that on the LinkedIn post this morning. It wasn't what I was expecting to talk about today. I was expecting to talk about home experiment manuals and the digital microscopes. And that's what I'm going to focus on. If I've got time at the end, I will talk to you about uh, interactive PowerPoints in case anyone was expecting that. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, um, in the same boat as everybody else, um, you know, we, we knew we had a lockdown. We we had to plan for um, at London South Bank. We had to plan what we were going to do in semester one um, for for practical sessions. Um, and we also had to have some contingencies. And, and ultimately, we decided to try and run the practical sessions in in semester one as scheduled. And they did go ahead as scheduled until that first week before Christmas. But in the background, we wanted alternative ways of doing things. And also, um, with one of the modules that I teach, which is a material science element, I wanted to be able to add some material to what we were teaching in lectures. It didn't currently have a practical element. So one of the things we considered was these home experiment manuals. So essentially thinking of ways that we could deliver experiments that were normally done in a laboratory in that home environment. So thinking about it in two ways, thinking about it as a replacement for a laboratory based practical session where we couldn't get onto campus and we thought that was going to happen at some point. But also, um, from my point of view, new material to supplement those lecture based modules. Um, so, you know, again, this is learning by doing. I thought it was something I could add to the module I was teaching to add a, a new element to it. So. Well, how did I do it? Um, I certainly didn't come up with anything from scratch. Um, we, we didn't really have time to, to generate that sort of thing. So a lot of it is Internet searches for existing experiments. Um, and, and I wasn't being fussy about which age they were aimed at, um, looking at things from the, the Royal Society of Chemistry and other sites that were simply um, giving you practicals that either had a forensic element to them or a materials element and adapting those to the context of what I was actually teaching. Um, and yeah, you know, again, as it says there, trying to give them an introduction to the subject of the experiment and tailoring that to what we were trying to teach on that particular module and giving some questions that the students had to research and answer. So what happens if you change this element of the experiment? And of course, um, pointed out to me very early on that when we were producing it, um, we needed risk assessment. So I was writing risk assessments for all of these um, and obviously trying to, to identify practicals that were simple to do and not risky um, for that less controlled home environment. And the example I'll give, the, the main example that I'll give is the module that I teach to our year one students, which is core material science and I teach material science elements. That, that's my first degree. Um, so what we're trying to do there is to teach students about materials, different types of materials, what their properties are and leading on to their relevance to forensic science. So things like, you know, what is a fibre made of, um, the different types of fibre, the natural, the synthetic and how they might relate to fibres in year two. Um, what's glass? What's the structure of a metal? Um, how how do, do metals deform and, and so on? Um, so what I was trying to find were experiments relating to these material classes that we could explore in the lecture slides, but also giving students the option to explore a bit more about that material in the home environment. So some examples um, and on all of these, as you'll see, probably very simple things that you, you've done at home, but getting across the context of what we were trying to teach. So one of the parallel elements of core materials in year one is a bit more chemistry. So a good electrochemistry experiment to look at metals is the classic um, bit of salt, bit of vinegar. Um, take your fairly worn copper coins and brighten them up a bit and then try and relate those to the reactions that are going on. And when you've got that solution full of copper. Put some bright iron based nails, ungalvanized iron nails in there and watch the copper coat onto the surface. And again, 
showing them the reactions that are going on, but allowing them to do that in a fairly safe, practical home environment. Another one, teaching them about polymers, um, casein polymer from warm milk and vinegar. Again, a very simple experiment, um, but showing them, introducing the context of polymerization and showing how you can form a polymer material from really simple and safe materials. One which is obviously has much more of a, a forensic science element to it, doing a bit of ink chromatography. And in this case, coffee filters, a bit of nail varnish, but asking people to try different solvents such as white vinegar, white spirit, um, and so on, and look at the different effect of the different solvents and the different type of ink pens. But again, this is all a year one experiment. It's all fairly introductory to the concepts of materials, and in this case, inks, but beginning to introduce them to how some of those things are used in a forensic science environment. But all of these home laboratory experiments. Also expanded it to um, year two experiments, marks and traces. And this is where we had to use this approach during lockdown. We had written a couple of experiments for fibres and fingerprint powdering. Um, but again, enabling students to use things around the home, household materials, allowing them to go and find some powders, try and see how they worked on different types of surface, different types of mark, whether it's a natural fingerprint or whether it's a deliberately greasy fingerprint, and for them to build up their appreciation of what types of powders work well, what types of surfaces the powders work on, and the development quality between the natural and groomed mark. So a practical application of something that they could do in that home environment um, safely. We've also had to, obviously, as the lockdown came in in semester two, <clears throat> we've had to take some of those practicals and actually use them as the main practical session. We're no longer supplementing what we're teaching. We've actually had to use that as the primary um, way of enabling students to do these, these practicals. But that's gone down pretty well. Um, we've posted materials to student addresses. Um, the engagement with the home practical sessions has been good. Certainly the submission rate and they're beginning to come in at the moment appears equivalent to the practicals held on campus in semester one. So we haven't seen a drop off in the student engagement by doing this. Um, and we we've, we've certainly haven't seen a drop off in the quality of the, the write ups being submitted. The other thing I wanted to touch on was was something that um, I remembered from from my time at the Home Office that one police force had started buying their scene of crime officers small digital microscopes to capture things like, like fibres at a crime scene. So I proposed this as something that we could actually buy for all of our students. Um, and you know you can do a lot of things with a, a reasonable digital microscope. So it's cheap, it's portable, it's something that we could give every student to take home and bring into practical sessions. Um, and it gives you an option of connecting to both laptops and smartphones. As it says there, unfortunately, we couldn't find a very cheap system with good connectivity to Apple products, but we did find a couple of workarounds that enable students who'd uh, invested in that type of product to, to work with it. And what we got, as you can see there, you know, you're talking less than 20 pounds for a microscope with a, a reasonable range of magnification. Um, it actually came with a scale and some calibration software, which was uh, no, very beneficial. Um, and yeah, we, we, we bought one for all of the students on the course. We issued them at the beginning of the year. And you know, while they were able to come into campus, they were using them during practicals. Um, in lockdown, they've been using them for some of those, those home experiments. So, and the different ways that all the years have used it. Year one, this was something they were using in their home experiments and also demonstration of some of the things that I was running in online tutorials. So I had a microscope at home um, during lockdown. I've been doing some practical demonstrations of, well, let's have a look at close up, look at some materials and I'd be able to share my screen and show students some of those things. Um, year two, we've used them during practical sessions. So we've used them during marks and traces and forensic biology practical sessions to capture some of the things that people have been um, looking at. I've tried to introduce it into another module, research methods, again, with a, with a home experiment manual associated with it. Um, and in year three, 
again used on the biological evidence module and in the research project where students are doing something that requires um, microscopy to be done. So some of the things we've done with it, here, here you go, some um, examples of leathers, different examples of wood captured through the digital microscope. And this is the type of thing that I was sharing on screen with the students during the, the online tutorial sessions. Also looking at things like failures, so looking at material failures. It's a couple of examples of failed metal specimens. So you're looking at the fracture surface and you're being able to introduce concepts such as ductility and a brittle fracture versus a ductile fracture. Um, showing them close ups of different types of black ink and you can begin to see the difference in appearance. And also you can begin to do experiments about the, the analysis of the order of writing. Here two marks and traces looking at glass fracture surfaces, getting some firing pin marks and the, the quality of pictures that students were able to take and put into their reports were far better than the pencil sketches they've been doing in previous years. So this was enhancing the quality of the, the submissions we were getting, whether they were doing those practicals on campus or at home. And here in year two, the research methods module, um, something which hasn't gone as well as I'd hoped because full lockdown has made it more difficult, but I've been trying to use it as a tool for students to generate data sets that we can start doing some statistical analysis. So for example, there we have a, a set of salt crystals on one side, a set of sugar crystals on the other side, um, do some particle size counting. Can we do a statistical analysis of the, whether there's a significant difference between the, the two types of particle? Um, and another experiment I'm, I'm wanting to try and introduce more is um, a transfer and persistence experiment just again to teach them experimental design and statistical analysis. So wiping one fabric past another and simply using the microscope to count fibres over different periods of time. So lots of ways that we're trying to use the microscope and now the students have got it, we can embed it more into the teaching that we're, we're doing and that that works equally well in a remote and a laboratory environment. So yeah, that's just an example of one of the things I've been doing with the students is to show them how to use tools such as ImageJ um, to generate process images and look at the number of particles and get an idea of the, the, the area of them. Um, feedback, I mean, this is something that's ongoing, so I, I haven't really got a complete year of feedback, but the feedback has been good. Um, so there's a couple of the examples of um, some of the first years saying some of the, the materials experiments they've done with the um, the home manual, some good feedback saying they've enjoyed it. We actually did the, the in chromatography one live um, during one of my lectures. So I was talking the students through it and several of them that were doing the same experiments at home. So um, and posting posting their results in the in the chat there. So you can see a couple of them that tried a few few options were beginning to explore different solvents, different types of pen and coming back with some of their thoughts. And the final slide is just another initiative um, that closely relates to it, um, but it's one of my colleagues initiative. Um, again, this is something we issued to all year one students. So we bought them a BBC Microbit kit with a good range of accessories. Um, and this relates to a module where we're beginning to introduce analytical equipment and measurement and control. So beginning to teach the principles of how you link a sensor to a microprocessor and actually obtain the data. And this again is the first year, but it, it's worked well in a remote environment. We've had some very good student um, uh, projects submitted using this BBC Microbit. So that's that's really all I wanted to sort of uh, skim through just some of the initiatives we've been doing at um, South Bank and some of the ways that we've adapted the way we're teaching um, to give students things they can take home and work with if they can't come into campus. So I'll, I'll pass back to Lisa and uh, Rachel and let them coordinate any questions you might have. Thank you Steve, that was absolutely brilliant and um, it's phenomenal what you've been able to do 
uh, with your students remotely from the labs. So I think it's so exciting when you consider material science and all the other experiments you've been able to do. Um, so moving forward, what other ideas do you um, have um, to develop this initiative? Well, I, I think, um, you know, there, there's certainly things that we'll need to look at and see some of the things that worked really well. I think we want to build on using the micro bit more and, and almost, you know, having some of these things that we give to students every first year and they will stay with them through their their period of study. Um, so I think, you know, we already have final year project students um, working at making their own sensing equipment using the micro bit, for example. Um, I think um, certainly with the microscope, it's something that um, it's it's so useful. I, I don't think we've we've really fully explored what we can do with it yet. Um, it, it's been there as an alternative to what they've had previously. But um, yeah, I want to do more laboratory practicals on the material science element, and I think that will be an integral part of, of, of doing that. Um, as I say, the frustration is with that um, research methods to, to use it to generate data sets is something that hasn't worked particularly well remotely because students just haven't had the the impetus to do it. So, yeah. you know, um, yeah, we, we're, we're thinking of lots of things we could do. With it. I think it's brilliant because it's shown how you can involve and engage students in, in activities um, you know, while we can access labs. So I think it's been brilliant that they've done the experiments alongside you. So I think that's it's given me so many ideas of how to take it forward. Um, Helen asks in the chat, how many microscopes did you have to buy for your students? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not as big a course as some um, people, but we typically have 40 students a year. So we bought 120. Yeah. And that and obviously on an ongoing basis, that'll be 40 every year. Yeah, 40 to 50. Yeah, that's brilliant. And um, one more question. I'm thinking about um, are there other experiments that you want to try and develop? Looking at the three year groups that you've targeted, um, I can just see the possibilities going hand in hand with on campus provision. Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, there's there's things that you can give people to take away and and do at home with those microscopes. Um, that you know, you don't. This doesn't all have to be into you know laboratory. You can let people take things and analyze them in their own time and you know take the pictures. I think that's the the thing that's been a bit of a revelation. The actual quality that you can achieve with that tiny little microscope. <laughs> um, and, yeah, the, the laboratory reports look brilliant compared to the previous year. It's, it's just. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's been brilliant because to see some of the images that have been captured, and I think it's helped um, um, students in their analysis and interpretation, I would expect. Um, from so. It saved a lot of time because, you know, rather than sitting making a pencil sketch and not necessarily capturing all the detail, you, you can now take that image and start annotating it and, you know, labelling the, the features of interest on, you know, the real image rather than your scribbled <laughs> best effort. Well, thank you, Steve. It's so um, brilliant what you've been able to achieve in such a short uh, space of time, all the different varieties of experiments as well. I think it's phenomenal. So um, thank you for sharing your, your practice with us. We're really honoured. No, well, thanks for the opportunity. It's uh, it's nice to see you both. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I just uh, again to to reiterate to say thank you so much to um for volunteering uh, to speak and to sharing. Uh, and it's so good to hear from lots of different uh, academic institutions. You know, who deliver forensics to you know in different ways and different types of practicals, different types of. Um, sort of pedagogic activity and it would be really great to to see how we you know we do look to integrate this into our practice in the future you know do you foresee um you sticking with a lot of these extra kind of the home-based activities to support learning as we move out of this post-pandemic era yeah i i think we will <clears throat> i mean we, we we've taken on a lot of the things that um i've, I've listened to on previous <laughs> remote forensic csi i think we can offer so much more with all of the 
the things that you know presenters before me have, have proposed and the things that I, I put forward today I think you can actually make it a much better offering mm. to students without having them come into campus for one you know one an hour one hour lecture on a particular day and then they go all the way home well you know do do more of that in the home environment um but certainly we we know you know the students they love the face-to-face -face contact so we, we can't <laughs> we can't lose that altogether but more of this yeah. to, to give them more opportunity to engage i think yeah definitely and i think you know to develop students and um, self-confidence in their ability uh, to do that at home, you know, even if it's not using the, the same chemicals or exactly the same equipment, just to build their confidence off, yeah. off campus will really help, I think, when they do go onto campus and they do those practical activities sort of live as well. So, um, but we've also had a question around, um, can we share the experiments? Like, are there the instructions anywhere? Steve, would you be willing to share any of the, whether, whether it's yeah. the actual manuals or whether um, it's a, a summary document that we could put on the Lecture Motley website so that- Of course, yeah, yeah. I, you know, they're all things I swipe from other websites, to be honest, and uh, put it my own spit on, but uh, yeah. That would be fantastic if so. And likewise, if anyone's listening who's, you know, tried uh, similar experiments or different experiments that, you know, you'd like to share with us we'd, um, and uh, able to be shared on the Lecture Motley website, then that would, again, be a really uh, great opportunity to to broaden the, the experience um, across, you know, um, and make them, them accessible to all, which is which is fantastic.